All right, notice with me as we come to Proverbs chapter 14. Last week we were in verse 14. We titled that the backslider. This evening I want to read from verses 15 through 17. I want to cover these three verses and we're going to title this uh, He That Is Soon Angry. We're actually going to take the title of the message from verse 17 and focus mostly on that. Notice as we come here to this passage, and uh, again, these three verses, we see the subject of prudence, uh, fearing God, and again, controlling our anger. Beginning in verse 15, the simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rages and is confident. He that is angry dealeth foolishly. And a man of wicked devices is hated. Heavenly Father, we do ask your blessings uh, upon the reading of thy holy scripture here today. Father, we ask your blessings upon the entire service, the singing, Lord, the preaching, the fellowship, all that we say and do. We pray that it bring honor and glory to thee. Lord, we do ask again tonight that as we are working our way through the book of Proverbs, we pray, Lord, for uh, your guidance in these passages we're going to look at tonight. Again, speak to our hearts. Lord, help us not just to see this and hear it, but also believe it and, Lord, and enact this in our lives. We ask all of these things in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Notice as we come here to verse 15, I'm going to focus mostly on verse 17, but... But notice verse 15 to begin with. We find here, he says in verse 15, he said, The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. Now we've run across the simple man and the prudent man already a number of times. And what we have here in this passage is that the, the simple the simple here is used in a bad sense uh, because it is contrasted with the prudent. Notice he said, The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his doing. Now, as we come to the Scripture, we see a number of times the simple or the simple man as a matter of fact, uh, Psalms 19.7 tells us that the simple are made wise by the Word of God. We would see this again in Psalms 116 and in verse 6. But the word simple, again, the simple, we'll say the simple man here, this describes someone who is naive, describes someone who is gullible, and also foolish. In other words, which believes uh, anything that comes along. And to give you an example, and I'm not asking you to turn to any of these. We, we um, Again, we're going to keep seeing this. But in chapter 1 and in verse uh, 22, uh, we find here in this passage, he said, How long, you simple ones, will you love simp simplicity? And the scorner delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. We would see this expression again uh, in uh, chapter, um, well, as a matter of fact, right here in um, uh, chapter, let me see here, chapter 7, I guess I should say, chapter 7 in verse 7, and I'm just going to give two or three, there's many. Chapter 7 in verse 7 uh, it speaks of the simple one who has no discernment, here in this case a young man. Also you would find this in chapter, uh, chapter 9 and in verse 12 and in verse 16. And then the prudent man would be mentioned in a number of places as well. Um, here in chapter uh, 14, uh, we find uh, in verse 8, uh, he says, "...the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way." But the folly of fools is deceit. Also, if you're taking notes tonight in chapter uh, 22, in chapter 22 and verse 3, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. 
And that, that passage there is repeated again in chapter 27 and verse 12. God gives us the same verse twice again so that we don't miss anything. So the simple here is not just the harmless or innocent in her passage. It, this simple here is contrasted with the prudent. And the prudent man is, or the prudent woman is the one who proves all things by the Word of God and finds God's will and abides therein. Uh, and, but the simple is the one that again is naive, gullible. Uh, they're foolish and uh, they will believe anything that comes along. Kind of reminds me of Acts 17 on Mars Hill. Always wanting to hear something new or to tell something new. And so, but the prudent man, we find that, uh, or the prudent woman, that they will always search something out. And, uh, and we probably have more simple ones and more fools today than ever because of the internet. You know, uh, I had someone, this has only been probably about six months ago, they came to me and they said something to me about a particular doctrine and I just looked at them and I said, you got that on the internet, didn't you? And they just looked at me and they didn't want to answer me. And I said, yeah, you've, you've read that somewhere and so you've believed it, but that is not in the scripture. And we were, we were standing on the street at the abortion clinic and, uh, and they, they just stood there and looked at me and I said, tell me where you found it at. They said on the internet. I said, have you found it in the Bible? Well, I haven't looked in the Bible yet for it. So that, that's the simple. That's the simple. Uh, again, this is much more here in this passage than just harmless or innocent. And again, the prudent man will always go to the Word of God and seek it out and find out what God has said. Let me give you three other verses uh, to go with this. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6 and 7. Uh, speaking of charity, and that would include the prudent man or woman, uh, when it says there that uh, charity believeth all things, in the context is speaking of the things of the Word of God. And then in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 5, the Apostle Paul said that our faith is not to stand in the wisdom of men. Again, we get back to the ideal of a fool or that which is simple. And then in Ephesians 4, verse 14, we need good doctrine and true truth, uh, so that we will not be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. So now notice with me as we come to chapter 14 and we come to the next verse, and that's going to be in verse 16. And again, we find another uh, repetitious verse, but God has a reason for this. And um, he says in verse 16, he said, a wise man which again is the prudent man, wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rages and is confident. And so we find here again the fear of the Lord, trembling at God's judgment. Now people, I've had many people tell me all Christians shouldn't fear the Lord. Well, it's not what we find in the Scripture. We find many, many places that we are to fear. We'd have a reverential fear for God and for sinning and rebelling against Him. And, uh, and so we find here it has the ideal of trembling at God's judgment and, and never trusting in ourselves. We're, we're to fear Him. Uh, we've already covered this, uh, so many times. Notice chapter 1 and verse 7. Chapter 1 and in verse 7, we've turned back here probably 10, 15 times already uh, and since we started this book. Notice chapter 1, verse 7. This is a wonderful uh, verse. Uh, by the way, in our chapter, before I read there, notice in, in our chapter. Notice back in chapter 14, verse 2. He says, He that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord. Notice also in, in, in chapter 14 in verse 26 and 27, in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence and his children shall have a place of refuge. Verse 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. So four times in just chapter 14, we find this, uh, the issue of the fear of the Lord. 
We've already come across it in chapter 3, verse 7. We've come across it in chapter 9 and verse 10, chapter 10 and verse 27, and chapter 13 and verse 13. Again, we see this over and over again in Scripture. In Job chapter 1 and verse 1, that was one of the characteristics, godly characteristics of Job. That he feared God. He eschewed evil. He hated evil. And uh, Psalms 34, 9, we see this. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2.12, he said that we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. He's writing to the church at Philippi. Romans 3.18, the lost, those that are lost, there is no fear of God before them, before their eyes. And then, before I read in Proverbs chapter 1, Hebrews, I'll make sure I get this right, Hebrews chapter 12, uh, in verse 28, listen to this. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So that's, that's it. Uh, and we've got an article and sermon, probably several sermons on fear, but got an article that shows the balance of this fear and reverence before God. But notice in chapter 1 and verse 7, uh, we... Uh, spent, I think, an entire message on verse 7, probably verses 7, 8, and 9. But let me just read verse 7, 8, and 9. He says here in chapter 1, beginning in verse 7, the fear of the Lord, notice, is the beginning of knowledge. Now, we're talking about the knowledge of God, the knowledge of Scripture. So, think about it. There is no true knowledge of the Lord without the fear of the Lord. Those who do not fear Him are considered as a fool. They may have a high IQ and be very intelligent with things of this world, but God calls them a fool. Now notice He said in verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Notice that. It's the beginning. That's where it all starts at. And by the way, salvation starts there too. Salvation starts when we finally fear the judgment of God and hell and the judgment seat and the lake of fire. That's, it begins there as well. He goes on to say, but fools, now notice this, fools despise wisdom and instruction. Many people just ignore the Scripture. They ignore what God has said in His Word and they're called fools. And He said in verse 8 and 9, My son... Keep in mind how this book is written by Solomon. It said, My son, hear the instructions of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Verse 9, For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. Notice as we come back now to chapter 14. Notice he said in verse 16, so he begins here, and he says, A wise man feareth. In other words, that is fear God. Now, we as Christians are told not to fear man. We're not to fear the things of this world, but we are to fear God. He goes on to say, and departeth, notice, departeth from evil. You could write down Psalms 34, verse 13 and 14. That is to depart from sin, the sin that we know that we have in our life. Uh, a wise man will fear God and they will depart from the sin that they know that they have. And then notice he says what the fool does. And by the way, you can write down Psalms 37, 27 also about departing from evil. But he also says, he said, the fool rages and is confident. Boy, isn't that so? In other words, we find here the fool rages. In other words, he acts proudly or she acts proudly and foolishly. Write down chapter 21, verse 24. Speaks of who, who, those who deal, dealeth in proud wrath. In other words, what does he mean here when he said the fool in verse 16 rages? In other words, they rush in where angels, uh, fear to tread. They just kind of rush into things. And so the fool rages. He's always in a rage. 
about something. And also we find that he says in the latter part of this passage, he in verse 16 he says, and is confident. In other words, he, his own wisdom leads him from God, or her own wisdom leads her from God. And the Bible tells us in, in Proverbs chapter 3, you don't have to turn there, but chapter 3 and verse 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. So the, the fool rages and also is confident in their own wisdom, and their own wisdom leads them from God. Now, I'll, I'll give you an example of this. You can write down 1 Kings 12, verses 13 through 17, Rehoboam. He strutted around like he was something, and he was stubborn. And when he was given advice by the elders, he was a young man, when he's given advice by the elders, he went to his peers and took their advice and divided the kingdom of Israel into two parts. In other words, uh, that was one of the sins that brought that kingdom down. Now notice now as we come to verse uh, 17. We'll spend a little bit of time on this. In verse 17, and they are a ton of verses to go along with this. I don't even know that we can get through by 9.30 tonight with this. But notice he said in verse 17, he said, And he that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. It seems like there's, there's two sins here. It seems like there's two thoughts here. The verse sets forth two forms of evil. The first one is just some, is just hasty anger and foolish actions. That's the first sin that's mentioned here. He said, he that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. Let us take this to heart. Um, who is this? This is someone who has a quick temper, easily provoked, has no control over his spirit or her spirit does silly and stupid things and says silly and stupid things. And so the first sin here is that he that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. I'm going to come back to the second part in just a few moments. Um, maybe I ought to go ahead and do it, do the second part and back up to the first because we will end up in the New Testament in just a moment. But notice, let's go to the second part. Again, it appears here that there are two forms of evil. One is just someone who is, that just gets angry quick, flies off of the handle, that kind of thing. But there seem to be another sin here, and that is a man of wicked devices is hated. In other words, he's hated by God and hated by men as well. And this sin here, the wicked devices, seems to be in, in someone who is malicious and revengeful. In other words, it would be a malicious and revengeful person who would secretly scheme and plot to get even or to harm someone else. And that might even be the most dangerous. In other words, it is a deliberate and planned out Ordeal. It's very spiteful and very hurtful. As a matter of fact, this person uh, may even hide their anger as the other person just spouts it out. This person may even hide the anger for a while until there's the opportunity to take revenge. Judas's carrot. No one knew that he was a devil except the Lord himself. And not even the other apostles knew that. Cain plotted to kill Abel. Had that hatred in his heart toward his brother. We find that Absalom plotted to kill his brother Ammon. We find that Haman in Esther chapter 3 and Esther chapter 7 plotted against Mordecai 
and the Jews. In other words, this is someone, when he mentions here the latter part of this verse, he mentions a man of wicked devices is hated. And you can see why someone who would plot and plan uh, their hatred that they would hold with inside. And when the opportunity came, they would take advantage of that. So we'll get that aspect of it out of the way. And let's come back and read the first half of it. And, uh, and then we're going to look at some verses on this. First part of it, he that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. Again, a quick temper, easily provoked. Notice just here in Proverbs alone, turn with me to chapter 12. We've actually already covered this verse, but notice in chapter 12. And let's just go through as many as we can here. And, and I'll just read them and not spend a lot of time on them because we'll be covering them as we get to them. Uh, especially the ones on the other side of chapter 14. Chapter 12, verse 16, notice a fool's wrath. I went through and highlighted these and underlined them so they would kind of jump out at me and remind me. Notice the fool's wrath is what? Presently known. But a prudent man covereth shame. In other words, he's cautious in his conduct. Notice with me as we come to chapter 15 and verse 1. In chapter 15 and verse 1. Here's a few quotes by other authors on anger. One writer said, Anger is the wind which blows out the lamp of the mind. Another writer said, People who fly into a rage always make a bad landing. Another writer said, it is better to swallow ang- angry words than to have to eat them later. How true it is, amen? And uh, this is a sin that we all have had to deal with at one time or another, is it not? All of us have to keep this in check. And um, it's, it's, it's the hurricane of the heart is what it is. It, it, it can destroy a person. Another writer said that he that would be angry and sin must not be angry with anything but sin. Now that's something we need to get angry at is sin. The Bible said be angry and sin not in the book of Ephesians in chapter 4. And another writer said he who goes to bed angry has the devil for a bedfellow. Never take your enemies to bed with you. That is so true. And then two more. Another one is, angry man is a slave to his own passion. How true that is. And then the last one, an angry man is again angry with himself when he returns to reason. And that is so true. Flies off the handle and gets angry and gets mad. And then he usually gets angry again when he really comes back to his senses. And so it's a double deal, isn't it? Notice in chapter 15, reading in verse 1, I I think these verses are probably more important to us to get in our soul and our hearts than even trying to figure out prophetic truth. He says in chapter 15 and verse 1, Notice a soft answer turneth away wrath. That's true, isn't it? It's true. And he says, but grievous, that's harsh, grievous words stir up Anger. Notice in the same chapter in verse 18, he said, A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. Notice as we come to chapter 16. In chapter 16, this is a very good verse, uh, a warning. Chapter 16 and verse 32, he says, And he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. You want to be mighty? Be slow to anger. And he goes on to say, And he that ruleth his own, ruleth his spirit rather, than he that taketh a city. And there's another verse just about like this. You think about this, of all the generals and leaders have taken cities before, and people studied the history of war and whatever, and they think how great they are. Well, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Notice with me as we come to uh, chapter 19. Chapter 19, 
I'm reading chapter 19 and in verse uh, 19. It says here, A man of great wrath shall suffer punishment, for if thou deliver him, yet thou must do it again. Notice with me as we come to chapter 22. In chapter 22, and these are only a few, but I thought this was important. Those who are soon angry, they're a madman or a madwoman. They're a fool according to the Scripture. In chapter, uh, chapter 22, verse 24, it said, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go. In other words, don't even go around them. Don't make no friendship with them. I told you last week not ride with a backslider. Well, this week I'm telling you don't be a friend with an angry man. Amen? Now, notice with me as we come to chapter 27. In chapter 27. By the way, chapter 25, I don't want to skip that one. Chapter 25 in verse 28, this is kind of parallel. It says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. In other words, if we have no rule over our own spirit, our own selves, we're like a city uh, that is broken down, no walls. In other words, we have no protection uh, for our soul and our spirit. Notice in chapter 27, chapter 27, uh, reading in verse 4, Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Three sins that are mentioned here in the passage. Wrath and anger are very similar. Notice again as we turn to um, chapter 29. Chapter 29, and this time in verse uh, 22. He says here in this passage, An angry man stirreth up strife, and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. So, God is very serious about this, and He gives us warning uh, also. If you're taking notes in Psalms, um, not Psalms, but Ecclesiastes 7, 9, says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. And you know, we find as we read through the Scripture, and I'm going to give you two verses on this. This is dealing with Moses. In Psalms 106, verse 32 and 33, and also in the book of Numbers, uh, beginning, well, in chapter 20, beginning in verse uh, 3 through 12, and the main text there is 6 through 12, we find that Moses was considered the meekest man upon the earth. And it doesn't matter how spiritual that we are, we can, we can violate the Scriptures. And Moses was a good man. He gave us the first five books of the Bible, but there was one sin that we see, uh, one particular sin in his life where God had told him, first time he told him to take the rod and hit the rock, you know, water would come out the second time he told him to speak to the rock before the people. And the people angered him. They had rebelled against God and rebelled against Moses, and Moses allowed that to get to him. And here's the thing, Moses' anger, this one little bout of anger of, of him and Aaron, this cost them the promised land. That doesn't mean they lost, they were lost and, and they lost their salvation. But they did not get to go in to the promised land. They both died and was buried before they went into the promised land. So, so that's how serious that God is with anger and with wrath and so forth. Well, notice as we turn uh, to the New Testament, notice when in Galatians 5, in Galatians chapter 5, very familiar passage. We read this a number of times each year, seem like. Uh, another verse you could write down, Psalms 37 and in verse 8, it says, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. This is a theme that we see all through the Scripture. I cringe when I hear somebody brag about what they will do to somebody else. 
you know, if such and such happens, that's scary. Hebrews 12, verse 14 through 17, bitterness is anger that has not been dealt with. That's where bitterness comes from. It comes from anger that's not been uh, confessed, it's not been dealt with, it's not been forsaken, uh, not been dealt with in the proper way. The passage I mentioned a moment ago is in Ephesians. I think we'll just, well, I think we'll turn there though. Let's read in Galatians first. Galatians chapter 5. Now we love to turn here and read the fruit of the Spirit. And we are going to read those. But let's first read the works of the flesh. In other words, a person can know whether they're walking with God or not. And we need, as the Bible says, examine ourselves instead of others. So here's, here's the list. And they, some of these you say, oh, I would never do that. But I want you to notice as we come here to Galatians 5 that we're going to find the words hatred and wrath which is anger and strife and murder. The Bible speaks of even murder in the heart in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. But notice as we read from verse 19, now he's talking about the works of the flesh. has nothing to do with the Spirit of God, contrary to the Spirit. He said, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. You say, well, I, I've never been involved in those. But what about the next word, hatred? Have we ever had hatred in our heart? He goes on to say in verse 19, variance, that is to vary from the word, the truth, emulation, jealousy, wrath, that's anger, strife, seditions, heresies. And he goes on, and of course, those who commit such things that are lost, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. As a Christian committed uh, any of these things, they repent of them. God will deal with them and and we repent of them. Notice in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 4, in Ephesians chapter 4, read just a few more verses. In Ephesians 4, verse 26 and 27, Be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. When he says here in in verse uh, 26 and 27, be angry, he's talking about a holy anger against sin and that which is evil. And, And he says, and sin not. In other words, this is not talking about righteous anger, but sinful wrath. And you'll notice that when we do sin this way with anger or anything, we allow the devil to get a foothold in our life. And the context here is in verse 22 is putting off the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt and, and deceitful. And be renewed in verse 23 in the spirit of your mind. And then in verse 24 is putting on something, putting on the new man, which after God is created in righteous and true holiness. And then notice as we come to verse 29, notice how many times he's speaking of the heart or our words. Beginning in verse 29 through 32, He says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. What we speak should always be edifying to someone else. Not tearing down and not in anger and wrath or whatever, and not even jokingly tearing down. What we speak should always be edifying to someone else. In other words, the word edify means to build up. To lift up in the Lord. And he goes on to say that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, don't make the Holy Spirit sad. Whereby we are sealed until the day of redemption. Verse 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. 
and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us. And He's forgiven us for all things. And, and I'm, I'm not going to read in Colossians because I'm going to start my sermon Sunday morning in Colossians. So I'm just going to give you the verse, chapter 3, verse 5 through 7. I'm going to be preaching on music, uh, sacred music versus secular music, music Sunday morning. So we're going to begin in Colossians 3.16 if you want to be looking at it ahead of time. Uh, so, but in Colossians 3, verses 5 through 8, it speaks of putting off anger and wrath and then putting on charity and things of that nature. Notice in James, I'm going to read in the book of James and probably close in Romans. Notice in the book of James in chapter, uh, 1, James chapter 1. You only have to listen to this for an hour. I've spent about eight hours on this. I tell you that every now and then because these verses work me over much longer than they might work on you. Notice with me in James, I have to make, I have to check myself and examine myself and make sure that I am walking true to these things. Now notice as we come to James chapter 1, we find that in verse 19, he said, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And usually we're the opposite of that. Now notice what he says, verse 20, an amazing verse. He said, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Any time we're angry, or speak angry words. It does not work the righteousness of God. In other words, it tears down the righteousness of God. And he says in verse 21, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity, that is, excess of naughtiness, and receive with meekness, meekness, we hear a lot of bragging today, don't we? Especially in our country. We're one of the proudest nations on the face of this earth. And he said, receive with meekness the engrafted word. Let this thing get in you. To graft, it becomes a part of us. And he says, with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls... But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. If we only hear and never do, we deceive ourselves. That's not somebody else deceiving us. That's not the devil or some other person. We deceive ourselves when we hear and we will not do. Turn with me please to James chapter 3. James chapter 3 and Romans and we'll close. We read these verses a lot every year. Love these verses. These verses have been a great help to me. Notice in James chapter 3, reading in uh, verse 5, he says, even the whole chapter, by the way, is on the tongue. And he said in verse 5, even so the tongue is a little member, and notice, and boast us great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Tongue is... Just a couple of ounces of weight, and it boasts us great things. And he also says in verse 9, he said, Therefore, bless we God, even the Father, therefore curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth cursing, blessings rather than cursings, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. And then, Beginning in verse 13, as we've been looking in Proverbs, he mentions the wise man. A wise man, and, and uh, he said, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him, let him show out of a good conversation. We come back to this thing about conversation, heart and mouth. And he says, out of a, Show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. 
But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth, that wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and ever evil work. But the wisdom that is from above, see there's a wisdom from below and there's a wisdom from above. And he said, but the wisdom that is from above is first, notice, pure, then peaceable, notice it's gentle, it's easy to be entreated, it's full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Oh, let these verses resonate in our hearts. It's so important. One more time. And Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Let me read verse 14 and then skip down and begin reading in verse 17. I read these verses often. I want them in my heart and mind. I want them to, I want them to control my spirit and my attitude and my heart and my words. Notice in verse 14, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Verse 17, you want some verses to memorize? Let these be the ones. Verse 17, recompense. Now we talking about anger and things of that nature. We talked about the revengeful man. Uh, recompense here has the ideal of revenge in this text. In other words, corresponding to injury with injury. You understand what I'm saying? Retaliation. That's the ideal. So he said recompense, that's like payback, recompense to no man, evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Let the Lord take care of it all. When we get angry and we uh, retaliate, we will always do it wrong and mess it up. But God knows how to do it because He's righteous. And then he said in verse 20 and 21, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the opposite of what Hollywood tells us. This is the opposite of what we see in the world. The totally opposite. You know, most movies nowadays are centered around getting even, you know. And I could list some off that I used to, that I'd seen years and years ago when I was law, and, uh, of, of revenge and getting even. And, uh, totally contrary to what we find in Holy Scripture. Would you stand with me? Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word, and we thank you for this privilege You've given us to be here tonight, and thank you for each and every one that's here. Thank you for the family that's traveled a distance that are with us tonight. We ask your blessings upon them and each and every member here. We pray, Lord, that we would uh, love your word. We pray, Lord, that we would take these things to heart. They would be meaningful to us. Lord, help them to navigate our life. And Lord, now we ask your blessings upon the singing, the prayer request, and then the prayer time here at the altar. For it's in Jesus' Christ's name we pray. Amen.